you like to work with metal, fire, electricity? Would you like to make money doing it? At Southwestern, we can help make your dream a reality. With our degree and certificate programs in welding, you'll be prepared for a career in the welding and fabrication industry in as little as a year. Check out our website and let Southwestern spark your career in welding today. This is Southwestern's dental assisting program. In just one short year, you could be a dental assistant. Sign up now for your one-year dental assisting certification. Good to go. Yeah. 
hours. Well, it turns out, uh, that's the rate. <laughs> and there's kind of gold, and there's trees, and the, and the mountains, and that sort of thing. But what did move is, is us. We moved, um, well, we live on a blue rock color, and during the two hours, the Earth rotated, and what that makes it seem like is that the stars moved across the sky. And so what we call this, a photograph like this called Star Trails, and it's an easy way for us to show that, hey, wait a second, we're not sitting still, we're actually moving. And, um, and so Marcus came and he sort of showed me this picture, and I'm like, Marcus, really nice, sir, C minus. And um, he muttered a few words, and it turns out that probably she was not too scary. And, um, and so he, he wandered off muttering words, and, um, but I will tell you what, a week later he came back with this. Marcus, well done. He went back down um, to a much darker site, and this is, by the way, uh, I'm not too far from uh, Eugene, this is a place called Fall Creek Dam. And so this is a, a, a place where Marcus took his camera out of the bed, and he did the same thing. Now, if you notice that the star trail looks a little different here, in this particular photograph, he pointed his camera to the north. And um, you can see, I think, a very uh, famous, a uh, very famous friendly star right here. It's called the North Star. And I'll let you note that the North Star is not exactly at the North Pole. It's a little bit off. And, um, so by the way, if you get lost in the woods, still look at the North Star and think of the North and all that stuff. But, but it is actually it's not exactly at the North Pole. So there's a tiny little bit of a difference. It only comes into play, for example, when you're setting up big telescopes and things like that. But um, Marcus went out, he did good, and we came back and we gave him a name. Well done, A plus. He did good. He did good. He actually listened to the verses, but he actually learned something. And so, and so that was a wonderful thing for all of us. So, the, just as a warm up, the, what I would really like to talk to you about today are three to four pretty important and relevant topics to this topic. We can be excited to spend some time with this evening. Uh, the first topic is, my, is, is a really important one. Um, you, and your place in the universe. If I do my job right over the next hour, uh, I'm going to change your mind about something. You may not change your mind, but maybe you your mind a teeny bit. That's what I'm shooting for. Um, the second topic is another favorite topic of mine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's my third favorite topic, my other. And, um, and, and, and so let's do that a teeny bit. I've got a funny story, I've got an interesting history to tell you. And then I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to try to convince you is perhaps. I say biggest, maybe the biggest, most important discovery of my life. And that's a profound statement. I'm going to try to do my best to see if I can back that up. And then, um, if you're feeling real bold, because I'm feeling real bold, what can I do? Um, the place is selfish, Tom. So, you know, you can get plenty of questions at the end towards the end. Um, so, anyways, overall, what I want to try to do is give you a scientific view of the universe that you have. And let me say a quick sidebar. And by the way, my students love when I say for the side of it, all the fishers are going to go off on a ramp. No ramp tonight. But I do want to say that almost every slide is not all the same day, and I picked and choose some of my favorite ones. But if you were to come and take my class, this is the type of class you would get. And I think that's very important because when I want to teach students two things, first of all, don't hate science. Okay? And secondly, science is important to you. Along the way, we teach them some astronomy and some neat stuff that they can take home and like that. But, but, but my class is really framed with the idea of science literacy. Can we, get, can we get everybody a little bit engaged with science in a cool way? And so I showed my students um, this picture on the very first day, and I made them describe everything that they can see in it. I won't do that to you all. You all have to be tonight. But it is incredible. You have, I think, I have, I have two, uh, 200 students a term. And get to look at the papers on the field. And, um, and many of the students will say something like, it's purple. There's, that's what we start. That's good. And, and of course, there's a huge spread. And some folks say there's lots of stars. And some folks say you can see the Milky Way. And you can see the cloud deck. And that tells us. Uh, the little sneaky secret is, and if anybody comes and takes my classes, here's a huge tip. What they don't realize is on the final exam, I put this picture on the final exam, and I make them describe it again. And what I have noticed, it's beautiful for me because I can see what they said on the first day and what they said on the last day, and it gives me an idea of what's sunk in. And I'm very proud to say that there's very few of them that just say purple on the final exam. They at least know a few astronomy terms, and we put them in there. 
but, but the goal for tonight is, is let's give you a scientific view of the universe that you live in and, and um, maybe change your, your perception on scale a teeny little bit. And if I do that, um, I'm going to be a proud duck tonight. Um, so again, my second favorite topic is me, and so we got to start. We got to start off with that. Um, again, this is something that I show the students. And, and by the way, quick sidebar: you know, nobody ID'd me when I came in here. I, I, I am not even B. Scott Fisher. I'm just saying. Maybe some random guy who's well, Aaron knows me, so I guess it's okay. It's all legit. But um, I am a product of state schools, and I'm very proud to say that. And I'm sure to say it. I have an AAOT from Lake Sumter Community College in Central Florida. So look, you can do it. This is a great start. Um, I did a year as an exchange student in uh, West Germany. <clears throat> you can remember how long ago that was now. Um, and then I came back and, um, and finished up my bachelor's degree and my PhD at the University of Florida. And on the first day of class, when I show this, this slide, this is where I make a joke and I go, oh, go Gators, go Gators. And that's the exact reaction that I get from the 200 ducks. Um, but, but then, of course, I show them this. I'm like, go ducks. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proud duck. And um, I've got to tell you a, a funny story about this. Me and Puddles were tight, you can tell. Um, and I was uh, actually pr I'm very proud of this picture because I have uh, uh, a couple terms ago, I had a, some student athletes came through my class. And they invited me, and they nominated me, and invited me to be a guest coach. And so I got to go and follow the football team through a whole uh, whole day. Uh, by the way, an incredible experience. And um, and then I got to watch a, uh, a game from the field, <laughs> not up in the stands with the common people, the students. <laughs>
need to describe was he. The first one, I think you can get clouds. <laughs> Daytime is not really fun. I'm still a astronomer, but I think it is a day. Um, but another thing that astronomers really do not like is distortion. We don't want anything that's going to distort the images and the data that we're going to gather with the telescope. And I can imagine that almost everybody, every person in this room has driven down 101 or I 5 on a really hot day. And what do you see just above the, the surface of the road? Right? You see, you see distortion by the air that's you know, Hat on and your, you know, bright orange vest, and there are air pallets and cranes and jacks and and all sorts of neat stuff. You walk in there and you don't feel like an astronomer so much, but I tell you what, you do feel like like you're about this tall because you walk in and you sort of see this massive blue machine and and just and just look up at it, and it's uh, so it's uh, really a wonderful thing. And um, I, I am doing my best to get Oregon students trained up and prepared so they can go and work at places like this. I'll tell you a success story um, later on. So I used to get to play with these massive telescopes, um, the, again, very fortunately some of the largest in the world and some of the best in the world, but I, uh, I traded. And, and, now, and now, I, now I work here, it turns out, at Pine Mountain Observatory. I can't, I couldn't resist. I have to tell you a little bit about Pine Mountain. Um, this, is, this is our observatory. This is a, an observatory that's owned by the University of Oregon, and it's located about 30 miles east of Bend, uh, not North Bend, um, the other Bend, in, in central Oregon, on top of a mountain uh, um, you might imagine named Pine Mountain. Uh, 6,500 feet, and it's an excellent site, and we have four, uh, we have four telescopes, one, two, I think this is popping up, three, and this little fella right here, which is my favorite telescope, um, which we sometimes, um, 
for somewhat obvious reasons. It looks like a Pac-Man right there. Um, and um, so I've switched big telescopes for four small telescopes, but um, it turns out that these are awesome telescopes because they're mine and I can do whatever I want with them. And, and, and that was a huge draw to, 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 bring, me here to, to bring me here to Oregon and, and to UO, and we're doing some wonderful stuff up there. Um, so again, it's, uh, it's, that's, it's, so there's four telescopes. Um, we are a nine acre UO campus in the middle of the Deschutes National Forest, about 165 miles away from the Eugene campus. The first telescope was built in uh, 1968, the same year I was built in. It's a vintage now, thank you very much. And the last telescope, the little robot, the Pac-Man, my students and I, we finished building that in, in 2015. Um, Pine Mountain is opened as of Memorial Weekend, Pine Mountain is open to the public on every Friday and Saturday night, um, and we have some undergraduate research projects that started last summer. And um, well, you know, we're getting all sorts of students involved. But um, this is the um, the thing I wanted you to take a peek at. The was I would love you all to come to and take a VIP tour, and and I mean that sincerely. Any person who takes time out of their day to come and hear me talk, you get a VIP tour. You get a VIP tour. You get a v anybody who comes to Pine Mountain, you get a VIP tour. And and so um, I have a bunch of cards here. Um, Pine Mountain is very easy to find online. And if you and if you get in touch with me and said I saw you uh, at at Southwestern, uh, you let me know, and there's a good chance that I'll be over there on the weekend that you show up. I'll be over there almost every weekend this summer. And so if you can get into Central Oregon, make a stop. By the way, it's too far to drive, so drive over, spend the night, and come back sort of thing. But I would love to show you Pine Mountain and what we're doing up there. And that's a sincere invitation. I'll only show you this. I mean, it turns out it's pretty awesome up there. This is a, a photograph of Pine Mountain that was taken by a different UO undergraduate named Justin. And um, this was a, a, a typical weekend night of last summer. The red lights are around the dome, and then you can see a little bit of a lighting here. There's a, a, a National Forest campground right across, the, right across the road. So if you're a camper, get a tent and, um, and come on up here and, uh, and spend the night. We'll show you the night sky probably better than you've ever seen it before. It turns out that, excuse me, Pine Mountain is located on the upper edge of the darkest remaining patch of sky in the contiguous United States. Northern uh, Nevada, eastern and central Oregon, western Idaho, and there's a big circle where there's just very little inhabitation. And if you go to, a, go to Google and type in light pollution map 2017, you can see an updated map of the light pollution of the United States, and that is the darkest remaining spot. We have ways of measuring the darkness of the sky, and we can compare it to Mauna Kea, and, and we are almost as good as Mauna Kea, quite, but we're getting there. And, and, and so this is a wonderful opportunity for us, particularly in the summer when the weather is good, and we do all sorts of cool stuff up there. Um, oh, I forgot the map was here. Here's, where, here's um, where it's located. And by the way, I have to show this in class because it turns out there's a lot of non-Oregonians in, in my class, and they don't know anything about our fine rectangular state. And so we have to show them where Willamette Hall is, where Eugene is, and then where, where Pine Mountain is. In about 165 miles between um, the physics department and, and my lab, it turns out. I've got a little commute to go if I want to go to the lab. Um, if you zoom in on Google Earth and take a peek at Pine Mountain, here's what it looks like. You can see the four domes are one, two, three, four. We also have a five room dormitory, which is pretty neat. We now started last summer. We've got students coming up there again. We've got sort of the operations house where the control rooms are and that sort of thing. And right here is a tiny little thing. We have um, the Pine Mountain. Mountain Observatory Welcome Center. Now, we do not have a gift shop because we are inside the Deschutes National Forest and you're not allowed to have any commercial activity inside the Deschutes National Forest. So we have a gift shop where we will welcome you to Pine Mountain with t-shirts and stickers and all sorts of cool stuff. So uh, don't come to the gift shop, but please come to the Welcome Center and, and, co and come up to Pine Mountain, and, um, and we will welcome you to Pine Mountain and then also show you some really neat stuff. And um, so what, do we, what are we actually doing up there? Our goal is to be mini Mauna Kea. We wanna take and uh, operate our observatory just like the big observatories are out, just like Gemini and Keck and Hubble and all of the professional observatories you may have heard about. And I sort of love this picture. If you remember, here's Naibi um, standing in Gemini and here's Taylor standing in our telescope. So it's a slightly different scale. As you can see, we have uh, what I think are tiny little telescopes, but on the other hand, they're ours, and, and we get to do what we want with them, which is kind of a cool thing. And um, I'll make a first small pitch.
Um, one of the projects that we're working on right now is to upgrade the internet connection to Pine Mountain. Um, here's a pop quiz question. Who in here remembers dial-up? <laughs> yeah, remember, keep, beep, beep, remember those noises? Well, we got that still. Um, so we've got dial-up internet to Pine Mountain, so that's not very good right now. Not a lot of Netflix going on up there. But we have a robotic telescope that is ready to be operated remotely. And so we built that, that robot from the ground up to be able to be controlled from anywhere. And um, we're working hard to get the internet upgraded. And, Fingers crossed this summer. And um, if that happens, I'll come back a year from now and we'll boot up the telescope and observe from right here. What do you think? Can we, can we do it? That's it. All right, I'm going to commit to it, so don't forget, okay? No, I, I will come back, and that's one of the goals that we want to do. So we'll see if we can get back down here and, um, and, 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 and fire that thing up. But if you can see what I really think, then, and by the way, this is one of the main reasons that they brought me here to UO, is that I think that our observatory is a training facility for students. And look, at, I see the students in here and some, some young folks in here right now. This is what you want to go for. Find a... Um, um, uh, uh, something or some, somewhere that you can get involved early in internships and lab work and this sort of thing, and it sets you up later on for professional work in that, in that same field. So let's use Pine Mountain as a training facility on, on relatively small telescopes, get the students trained up, and then ship them off to the big telescopes for staffs, astronomers, and engineers, and technicians, and all the things that we want everybody to do. I just truly feel that Pine Mountain is, is, is an excellent STEM facility, and we can engage students in all majors there in a cool way. Um, our main, this is the, uh, the robot itself, it's called the Robbins due to a, a very generous donation from a gentleman named Ken Robbins. It's a 14 inch telescope, so you know, it's a, it's a tiny little beast, it's about this big around and about that long, you can almost carry it yourself. Um, it's really a state of the art system. Uh, Turns out telescopes sort of have three main components. There's uh, this part is the mount, the thing that the telescope sits on, and that's really the brains of the operation that tells the telescope where to point and how fast to move and, 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 and all sorts of that sort of stuff. On the back end, we have a camera. We have a very, um, a very sensitive camera and filters and automatic focusing and all sorts of the same sort of stuff that your cell phone camera has, but in a super duper version. And then you have the telescope itself, which is where the optics are, the mirrors are. In our setup, we have a uh, Cadillac, top of the line Cadillac mount that the telescope is on. It's super smooth, super slick, air conditioning, all the whole nine yards. We have a, a, a Ferrari camera with uh, really excellent filters and perfect focus. And we have a 1992 Ford Focus Blue Bomber uh, for a telescope. And, and, and so we love the Blue Bomber, um, but I am, I am very proud to say this is the very first talk that I can give where I can say that the days of the Blue Bomber are gone. We have just ordered a brand new Maserati level telescope um, to put on that. And by the time any of you folks get up to Pine Mountain this summer, we'll have a brand spanking new carbon fiber, um, super kick butt telescope right here to show you how it works. And, and so um, bye bye Blue Bomber. And um, the beauty is, if you look, is that um, we will soon be able to remotely operate the telescope from here but slightly more importantly is also from the UO campus where um, we're building a control room and we will be able to literally sit down and log on it just like we're up at Pine Mountain. So we're, we're, we can't, I can't bring um, 200 students to the mountain, but I can bring the mountain to the students in some way. And what are the type of things that we do up there? Here's um, myself back in the background um, and three of my students and the gentleman who works for me up at Pine Mountain. And we were um, in the dorm um, analyzing some data that we just took. Quick sidebar, it was freezing cold this night, and I would like you to guess which student is from Oregon and which student is from California. <laughs> Oregon, California. Okay, so, um, and so, so it was, by the way, we, this is before we had the heater in the room fixed. It's now fixed. Um, but we were very excited. None of us could sleep. It was about 4.30 in the morning. I remember right when this picture was taken. And what we were looking at is this data right here. This is a, a galaxy named M66, a very unceremonial sort of name, but it was very exciting. We took three different images and in, um, in, in different filters, and you can stack them together to make a color picture. And, um, and why are we so excited about this? Well, it turns out, oh wait, sorry, I'll tell you why, is the, um, there's a supernova that popped off that exploded in this galaxy. And if you look, it is right that little star right below there. 
Um, and the neat thing about this is we got an email that we're on a, a list that when these uh, things are discovered, you get an email and they say, please go and look at them. And about 10 hours after this thing was discovered, we got this data. It turns out that we were the second group in the whole world to observe it. And so again, we're, we were real proud of that. And we got to analyze our data and we then submitted our data into this big world uh, database of worldwide observations. And so, you know, it's a small thing, but you know what? It was a big thing for us and a really big thing for the students, particularly the Californian student who froze her butt off, um, getting the data reduced. Um, but so all of our students got our names on a little uh, what's called an announcement, and um, then we and we we sort of gave them their first taste of professional astronomy, and that's a big deal. And I, again, just a quick sidebar: um, charity. Right, all three of my students are graduating this term. Charity is going to the University of Arizona for graduate school, uh, the number one or number two astronomy school in the country. Uh, Jacob is going to the University of Amsterdam where he'll be doing a uh, dual astronomy data science major. And Lindsay is just now applying for jobs at Gemini. So I think it's working. She's going to see if we can get her a job at that big telescope. Um, so look, there's uh, Pine Mountain and what we're doing. And I hope that um, I can convince you a little bit maybe to take a, a four or five hour road trip and, and come over and see us sometime um, this summer. It would, it, would, it would be great to see you there. But if not, hold tight and I'll bring the telescope to you in a year or so and we'll use it from right here. So what about this cosmic perspective thing? I can't not come down and talk about one of my other favorite topics. This is sort of a part of a lecture that's maybe a third of the way um, through, through the class. We spend the first few weeks of class really building up an idea of vocabulary and sense of scale. I think it's a very important thing. And this particular constellation is one of my favorites. Who knows what constellation this is? Orion, Orion sure it is. It's Orion. Uh, wonderfully visible here in, in Oregon in our in our fall and winter skies and um, it, it, it's really an excellent example of not only a constellation but there's a lot of astronomy and astrophysics that's happening in this part of the sky but you know what this is how Orion looks to us we all look up and we can see it in the sky and and you sort of get this feel you've got the bright orange star up here it's called Betelgeuse there's a bright blue star down here called Rigel there's the three stars in the belt and there's also this little thing oh, right next there called the Orion Nebula. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on up there. But you know, our eyes have a really difficult time dealing with a couple different things. And one is in the night sky, it's very difficult for us to not think that we live under a dome. You look up and, it, it, you know, we've made, most of us have been in a planetarium and we hit this idea, well, sure, that's what the sky looks like. You know, the stars are up there on the dome. As a matter of fact, for a long, long time in the history of humanity, we actually believed that there was something up there called the celestial sphere and that the earth was inside a sphere and the, and the stars were little holes poked in the in the sphere letting through the light of heaven and and um it turns out it's not quite like that but um but our eyes when we look out at the night sky perceive this idea of a dome i'm not mad at the ancient folks because it really looks like that but you know what orion actually looks like is this if you look from down on earth those stars are at vastly different distances from each other even though these two, let's see, this one and this one, they look like they're right next to each other. They actually aren't. This one, let's see, let me make sure I'm picking the right two. It's this one and that one. So, you know, you sort of hold your fingers together and they look like this, but in reality, one of those stars is much, much farther away than the other one. And it turns out that the most distant object of all is actually the little fuzzy thing called the Orion Nebula. It's about 1,500 light years away. Just kind of keep that, that number in your brain, and I'm going to tell you how, how far away that is here in a few minutes. But this, this, this idea that we live in a 3D universe, I know that we all know it, but we don't perceive it like that very well. And so one of the things that I truly try to do in class is, is to convince, not convince, but to show the folks, and the students in particular, that we do live in a 3D universe. And uh, a, a gentleman named J.P. Metsav Anaio, that's not exactly how to say his name, is a Finnish guy, and I looked him up online, and J.P., he's my man. He's an astronomer, a computer scientist, and a photographer, triple nerd. I mean, he hits, he hits all of my favorite things. And what JP figured out how to do is to do a visualization that lets us sort of understand that we live in a 3D universe. This is a photograph of a 
pretty well-known nebula. And what a nebula is is a very large cloud of, of, of dust, just like dust right here. It's not too much dust here. This is a very clean podium. Um, and gas, and gas meaning hydrogen gas and helium gas, and uh, um, not gas like gasoline, but gaseous, um, you, know, um, you know, gas itself. And, and, but you know what? That is not flat. That thing actually is like this. And what JP figured out how to do is to take a static image like this, do some sort of computer magic. By the way, it's a, what I would call a visualization. It's not, uh, it's not a true animation. It's, it's not completely fictitious. But he did take a little creative license to make this effect. What he did is he figured out how far away most of the stars are in that image. And then he built a three-dimensional model of the cloud. And, and it turns out you can trick your brain into seeing 3D just by taking this model and rotating it back and forth. And what I hope you can see here is, the, you know, like for example, these two stars are sort of in the front. The nebula is, a, is this big, dare I say, nebulous cloud in the middle. And then there's stars that are back behind it. And just by rotating that image back and forth a little bit, it tricks our brain. It turns it into 3D mode for us. JP has done several of these animations. Here's another one that I like. And here's one of the interactive parts of the, of the, of the, of the talk. Everybody take your hands out real quick and make a, make a bowl. Make a big bowl shape in your hands. And now, if you take a peek at this and look, the bowl is rotating like this back and forth. The inside of the bowl is painted that turquoise color. And, and, and just to, that helps me thinking that, I, that, that to see sort of the 3D nature. Right here, right below there, that's a star cluster. And inside that cluster of stars is about 50 young stars, and they are burning very, very brightly and giving off lots and lots of energy. So much energy, in fact, that they are literally pushing away all of the material that's in that big cloud. They are, they are actually carving the bowl out of the size, out of the size of the, the side, excuse me, the side of this very big cloud. And, and, and to me, it just gives it a, a neat uh, three-dimensional sort of um, shape. And this cloud that you're looking at here and this one are exact analogs of what we just showed you, the Orion Nebula. And so your one of many little homeworks I'm going to give you tonight, it turns out, is, uh, is next winter, we're coming into the good season, but next winter when Orion is up, you take a look at the sword of Orion and the center spot in the sword of Orion is fuzzy, that's the Orion Nebula. It's the only nebula that really you can see with your naked eye, and it's a, a wonderful sort of example. And um, I've, I've actually wrote JP, and I said, JP, do one of these for the Orion Nebula. He never got back to me, but I have my fingers crossed that someday um, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get one of these um, for, for the nebula too. But so again, this is the idea that we live in a three-dimensional universe. And I'll tell you, show you something cool about that again. Um, just a strict um, vocabulary slide that we use in, in, in class, but I want to um, I want to talk about planets for a second and transition into exoplanets. But how do you define a planet? You're like, well, planet, planet Earth, it's right here. We have, it's a planet. Well, sounds good, but what they are? Planets are large objects that orbit stars, right? We don't we they don't orbit each other in some sense. They can be rocky like the Earth, icy like Pluto, or gaseous like Jupiter and Saturn. So just to kind of orient us real quick, and I want to show you a picture of my, oh, this is always tough. I think it's my second favorite planet, really. Earth wins by, just by this much, yeah. But, um, but Saturn is pretty darn cool. And this is a view of Saturn that we cannot ever see from Earth. And this is a photograph that was taken by a spacecraft called Cassini. And um, Cassini was in orbit around Saturn for about 10 years and discovered some incredible things and took some beautiful photographs. And by the way, the, we, the reason that I can confidently say that we can never see this from Earth is Cassini was above the North Pole of Saturn right now. And I bet you, you can all take a stab, which direction is the sun from here on this picture, right? It would be over to the right. Yeah, and you can see the shadow of the, this is the shadow of the planet on the rings right there. And I just think this is a lovely orientation to this particular photograph. This is a picture of Saturn, and by the way, this is Saturn's moon Titan right there. And I'm going to make a case to you 
that this is the best photograph of Saturn that has ever been taken from Earth. This is taken, again, from a telescope up, up on the top of a big mountain in Hawaii. Why can I say that? Well, I can say it because um, it's one of the biggest telescopes in the world, and this particular telescope has a camera on it that takes some of the highest resolution images that we know how to take. It removes the distortions due to the Earth's atmosphere. It's an infrared camera. There's all sorts of reasons why we can confidently say that this is the best image of Saturn that's ever been taken from Earth. By the way, Saturn is not pink and purple. We, we colored it, these colors, because we wanted to highlight the fact that the material that makes up Saturn is very different than the material that makes up the rings. Saturn is a gas giant, so Saturn is primarily hydrogen with some helium mixed in there, and interestingly, a soup of other sorts of molecules, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, sugar, methane, um, alcohol, the good alcohol. Um, uh, there's all sorts of stuff up in Saturn, um, but there's no, there's no ground. You're not going to stand on Saturn. But the rings are actually tiny little dust particles and pieces of ice. What we think the rings are, they were uh, a moon of Saturn that ventured too close to the planet and got crushed up. And over the last, you know, several million years, those have been ground down into the, uh, into the very small um, particles that make up the rings. Quick sidebar. So the point being is that this is about as good of a photograph as we're ever going to be able to take from here on Earth. And now I want to show you the best picture of Earth that has ever been taken from Saturn. There's Cassini again. You see yourself? That's you. You're, you're in that picture. Were you, was anybody here on Earth in 2013? Okay, okay, yeah. Most of us anyways, that guy down front, maybe not, but you are in that picture. And by the way, so is every human being. Me, you. And by the way, so is every human being who has ever lived on that dot. And that's us. And I'll do you one better. If you were in Oregon in July of 2013, you were literally in that picture because the western coast of the United States, Hawaii and, and Australia were facing Saturn when this picture was taken. And how do I know? Well, this was the day the Earth smiled. And this is an amazing story. NASA knows so precisely where Cassini was around Saturn that they knew that on July, well, not July 19th, 2013, Cassini was going to fly behind Saturn and it was going to swing the camera around and Earth was going to be there. And they predicted this and they had this big sort of outreach event where some people in this room, <coughs> me, um, at what time was it? It was 9 at, at, at 11.27 in the morning on July 19th, 2013, one of us walked outside on the UO campus, looked up to where Saturn was, and looked at his watch, and counted down, and looked around, and went and waved right when they took the picture. So I'm, I'm just saying um, that I, I feel immortalized in some sense, that, um, that um, not only am I in that picture, I'm actually waving. And, 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 and I just, I, I sort of love this for, for the, the connection in, in some way. Um, and of course, I got sort of a two funny looks as students were walking by. They're like, what the hell is Fisher doing? Um, and, but um, I, I urge you to go to Google and look this up sometime. And by the way, this photograph down here in the corner is a mosaic of several thousand people that were waving at Saturn. So I was not the only nerd that day. Um, but I love, I love this picture for that first, for the little bit of sense of scale, folks. Just from Saturn, which is literally right next door, our planet already looks like that. And you know what you can't see right there? Borders, you know, anything like that, right? I, we're all humans at some level. We're Americans and Oregonians and, and, and ducks and beavers. <laughs> and um, and all, I'm just picking, I like the beavers. And, um, and we're all of those things, but I wanna try to just tonight remind us that we are also all earthlings. And we all live on a beautiful blue little marble that literally is our spaceship that's carrying us through space. And by the way, for you philosophers in the room, there's no turtles, you'll notice, and there's no string holding that thing up either. That's us right there. I love that stuff. I'll show you something else cool. They're only models, okay? 
But here, the, I saw somebody with a very controversial t-shirt on here, the eight planets of the solar system. Uh, ask me afterwards, I'll talk about Pluto. Um, but so I love these models for one reason. First of all, they give us a beautiful depiction of the, of the planets, but more importantly, these are all to scale. And so we can walk through them real quick. Here is uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, um, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So there's the eight major planets, and those are all in proportion to each other. So, you know, roughly one Earth will fit basically right inside uh, the great red spot of Jupiter. But you know that's not all that's in the solar system. There's actually one thing that we forgot right here, and that's the sun. And, and here's again the same eight models with a model of the sun also to scale. And it's a teeny bit hard to see, but here's you right there. That's Earth. Um, compared to the sun. And this to me is what I call for the students in class, I think this, this is their first perspective check of the term in some sense. 109 Earths will fit across the diameter of the sun. Is that, is that, have you ever thought of 109 Earths before in your entire life? It's a crazy idea, 109 Earths. There, there, there's one Earth, the pretty one, you know, that we have. 109 planet Earths. And the way I think of it is sort of a, a beautiful beaded necklace, 109 little beautiful blue beads that would, that would just, just string right across, right across the diameter of the sun. This is, this is real. This, this is actually how it is. There's very, very different ways that we can measure this, but we are very, very confident about this. Don't look at the sun. Let me tell you one of my major fears is, four of you astronomy students get blinded when they don't look at the sun, please. However, the next time you see the sun at sunset, take a glance at it. That thing that you are used to looking at through your whole life is that 109 of our planets will fit across that thing. And the first couple of times you sort of look at it and think about it, it takes a little bit to sink in. But I, I wish for everybody in this room that you do this a few times because it sinks in. And finally you just have like a <gasps> sort of a moment where you, maybe you sort of imagine that or something like that. But this is 109 of our planets fit across our sun. And by the way, our sun is just a stinky old star. Just like every, that's a very special one, it's ours but it's a very average star in, a, in the sort of suburbs of a, of a very normal galaxy called the Milky Way. And every spot of light that you see in this picture is a sun just like ours. And I always like this sort of idea that somewhere on one of those stars, that one or this one or that one or that one or that one, or that one, one of those, there's, there's a bizarro astronomy 100 class with, with my, my anti-fisher is giving a talk and, and they're looking back towards us. And, and our sun is just one of those, their stars in the sky. And, and, but that could be. And, and, and to me, that is again, just another way to kind of expand our understanding in some sense. But our sun is just one of them one of many, many, many stars up in the sky. And I'm gonna stick with me for 10 minutes and I'll tell you how many of them are up there. So here's a place in Oregon where it never rains, or so they say. Sorry, that's a duck joke for anybody who's not a duck. Um, I was surfing around Google Earth one time and I figured, and I found out that you can measure distances in Google Earth. By the way, it's a cool thing. You measure distances from here to Eugene or, or across the stadium as a matter of fact. And I thought, you know what, how big is that stadium? You take a line and you draw right across Otzen, that is 660 feet in diameter. And I thought, 660 feet? That's weird. I'm six foot four. What is six foot four times 109? Damn close to 660 feet. They could, you are to Otzen Stadium as the earth is to the sun. Think about that. First of all, think about 109 of me. That would be an army. We would rule this planet, I'm pretty sure. Just checking. You can take 109 of you, tip to tail, and you're going to fit roughly across that stadium, just like 109 Earths will fit across the front of the sun. And that, so the next time you're 
at a, you know, a concert or a, or a stadium or, you know, I think Reser might be a little smaller than this, but that's okay. Try it anyways. Think of you as the earth and that stadium as the sun. And by the way, walk up to the stadium and give it a little, uh, 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 a little, give it one of those. How much did you move that stadium? <laughs> None. Exactly as much as the earth influences the sun. Not much. So I just think, again, this is this neat way. Can we take some of this indescribable size and somehow scale it to a way that makes it a little more tractable to us? And, and, and you, compared to a football stadium, is the earth compared to the sun. I just think that is a, that's, that's a neat way to, to sort of bring it home. Oh, don't worry so much about this other stuff. But I do think one thing that's pretty neat is that the distance to the sun is about 93 million miles. And I love saying that, and everybody goes, whoa, 93 million miles. And then the follow-up question is, how far is 93 million miles? I don't know either. It's just, it's again, it's a crazy 93 million miles. That's farther away than Portland. <laughs> it's farther away than San Francisco, probably, you know. I mean, 93 million miles, it's an, it's an insane number. So again, what we try to do is scale it in a way to make it a little more understanding or understandable. And, and the way that we do that is we use this constant called the speed of light. Turns out the speed of light's fast, even faster than I drove down 101 today. But it takes about eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the earth. So the eight minutes ago, I was probably rambling about Autzen right before I got to Autzen. So, you know, think about eight minutes is about how long it takes light to get from the sun to the earth. It's going to be interesting here for in a second. A very quick sidebar, because what I learned teaching Astronomy 100 is the students don't know anything about the moon, is the next time you see a full moon, if you want to visualize about how big the moon is, it's almost exactly the size of the continental U.S. This is something that I, I didn't make this, I found it online. But the next time you see a big beautiful moon up in the sky, big full moon, sort of think of a map of the U.S. sort of superimposed over the moon. It's about how big the moon is. It's about 2,100 miles um, across, about one quarter the size of the Earth, actually. And the distance to the moon is about one light second. Again, quarter million miles, that feels a little more tractable. 1,001. Take a laser pointer and, and shine it at the moon, and one second later, that light bounces off the moon. That same laser light would take eight minutes to get to the sun. So again, we're starting to build a little bit of a model here in some sense. The moon, of course, is our closest neighbor. It's right next door. It's sort of right where the mic is. And then the sun is, is our nearest big neighbor. So one second to the moon, eight minutes to the earth. Now let's see if we can do this for real. When I first started teaching, I ran across, uh, I ran across um, something called um, the grapefruit scale. And you'll now notice the wonderful prop that I brought today is I've been sitting up here teasing you the whole time. If you take the sun and shrink it down by some crazy factor, it doesn't even matter what it is in, 10 billion, imagine that the sun is now the size of a lovely large grapefruit slash softball. And why is it a softball? Because a student, this is a gift from a student, because I used to go, imagine the sun is a grapefruit. And then, then so she painted me a softball that looks like the sun. And ever since I've been using this. So it's now the softball scale. So take the sun and shrink it down to right here. You're holding the sun in the hand. And now what you didn't know is there actually are pop quizzes. Sidebar. You know what's really hard to do is put your hand up. Pick one of these answers. Who picked A? Everybody's a D's. That's hard. So you know what we do in class? We do a throat vote. A is one. Oh, sorry, I even changed them to one, two, one, two, three, four. And so what, so here's your job right now. Nobody else can see you. Answer this question for me. If this is the sun, how big's the earth? One, two, three, or four? Go for it. Got some twos, we got some, good. okay, we got ones, we got twos. No fours? You guys listen too well. B, the two, tip of a ballpoint pen. So it makes about sense, right? Take 109 ballpoint pen tips, and that would fit roughly across this softball. <laughs> That's the entire planet. But by the, how big are you? 
I don't know that one. Okay, <laughs> you're tiny, teeny tiny. But, but so this is already the first thing, right? Here's the sun, there's the earth. Tiny little pen tip. You're doing good, you got to see so far. On the same scale, how far away are these two things? Now, that's interesting, right? It's eight light minutes. That doesn't help so much, does it? What are we thinking? One, two, three, four. Four, four, five. Good spread. Good spread. Five miles. Oh, there we go. So look, this one we have more. And see, what the neat thing is, is I can see, right? I can see all your votes, but nobody else can see your vote. And by the way, this really helps get an engagement with the students too in class. It turns out this is a funny one, 50 feet. So you think about maybe over the other side of the stage, sun, and here's a tiny little pen tip, 50 feet over there. By the way, on this same scale, the moon is about one inch away. So you've got the earth and the moon, tiny little pair over there by the flag. So, you know, you could fit the earth, the sun and the earth, you know, the orbit in this room. Turns out Pluto is about 40 times farther away than the earth. It's 2,000, what's half a mile from here? I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know. So, can't, I'll bet you campus, the UO campus is about as big as the solar system. So, you know, you think if we painted the sun in the middle of the campus here, we could, on this scale, the whole solar system would be roughly the size of campus, maybe a little bit bigger. The whole solar system would fit on this campus. This is a funny one. How far away is our neighbor star on this same scale? You think, well, you know, okay, look, sun, earth, Pluto is over there, not too far away. And then the next star, the next star over, you forgot some sugar, you want to go and, you know, ask your neighbor to get a cup of sugar. What do you think? What are we thinking? Do we even have a, we have a stab? Threes. We got threes. Oh, we got twos. We got ones. Oh, I see somebody up here going, mm, that doesn't count. Turns out, yeah, <laughs> you, you can't go like this. You can't, like a, a baseball batter or a catcher. This is perspective check number two. 2,500 miles from here. <laughs> There's the sun, and our nearest star is a glowing softball on top of the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. I say that because I used to live there and flew by it a hundred times. I'm like, oh, this is the glowing grapefruit on top of the, okay. 2,500 miles. The earth is right here where that flag is. And the, our nearest star is in Washington, D.C. That I ask you to ponder afterwards a little bit. And let me tell you the best way to ponder it. Go to Pine Mountain. Go somewhere where there's a dark sky. Come to Pine Mountain. Every point of light you see, cover up the Milky Way there real quick. Every little single point of light that you see is our stars, our neighbor stars. You can't see Alpha Centauri there, by the way, which is the closest one. On average, every point of light that you see there is about 50 times farther away than Alpha Centauri, 20, 20 to 50 times. I don't even know what is 20, what is 20 times farther away than Washington, D.C. That's, you know, 40, twice around, the, or twice around the earth. So this is, again, one of your little homeworks. When you see a really dark sky the next time, first of all, the 3D thing. You live in a three-dimensional universe. Those stars aren't right next to each other, even though they look like they are. And then this scale a little bit, that if one of those stars was this size, the things that you were looking at are thousands and thousands of miles away. And I think that is the, that's humbling in, in, a, in a good way. In, in, in a way, I think that, you know, it, it, um, it gives you some humility in, in an interesting way. And now we take another step out. This is not the Milky Way galaxy, but this is a galaxy that what we think is an analog. If we could take a picture of our galaxy, this is what we think it is. And where we live, um, I, we live in the burbs. I make this joke in Eugene that 
You know, here's Portland downtown. There's the big city, the center of the, of the galaxy. Out here is uh, Junction City. Again, I'm sorry if I'm picking. This is a tiny little town. I'm not too far out of Eugene. And here's where we live. We live in the burbs. We live about halfway um, between the center of the galaxy and the edge of it. And, but here's a neat thing. Let me do this real quick. The size of the galaxy is about 100,000 of those light years. Now let's take a step here. It's one second to get to the moon, eight minutes to get to the sun, five hours for light to get to Pluto, four years for it to get to the nearest star, and 100,000 years if you wanted to get across the galaxy. Here's the thing that I really, really think is cool about this picture. You might not have seen it. Watch, watch coming across the screen. Whoop, this little guy right here. That's a, that's a picture of the duck that I shrunk down as, as much as I possibly could. Every star that you have ever seen with your naked eyes is underneath that duck. Yes, ma'am. Every one. And by the way, a lot more that you can't see with your eyes. So when you go out, even at Pine Mountain in a beautiful dark night, and all of those beautiful sparkling stars that you see up in the sky, those were our neighbors. Those are the ones that are just barely, and by the way, I could shrink that duck down another factor of 20, and all the stars that we can see with our eyes are still gonna be underneath it. I made it big just so we could see it a little bit. One pixel on this, on this image covers every star that you can see with your eyes. And I think, again, that's a humbling, a humbling uh, thing in, in, in a way. I think it gives us a, an interesting perspective to sort of ponder. A galaxy like the Milky Way, again, this isn't ours, might contain 100 billion stars. 100 billion, that is 100,000 million stars. And, and a neat thing that, that, that we now think is we think that there are probably planets around every one of those stars. Now look, I, I, I'm gonna, I, I, it's because I took too long, I'm going to skip a couple things. But I'm going to tell you about exoplanets real quick. Oh, okay, i got to stop here, though. If you want five points extra credit in, in Fisher's Astronomy 100 class, you have to send me a postcard. And you don't just use your address, you have to use your cosmic address. Quick sidebar, I actually did this. I put a stamp on a postcard and used my cosmic address and sent it, and damn it if they didn't deliver it. So now, about every 10 weeks, the Eugene um, post office goes, it's the astronomy guy again. And you get about 200 students sending postcards with your cosmic address. What is your cosmic address? It's your address. But folks, you don't just live in Coos Bay, 9740, okay, <laughs> whatever it is. You, know, you also live in Oregon and the United States and the Northern Hemisphere and Earth and the solar system and the Milky Way galaxy and the local group and the local supercluster and the universe. So we don't think about those other steps often. <laughs> you know, we sort of stop with, you know, Coos Bay, Oregon. But you also live in all of those things. Right now, it turns out we're in the solar system and the Milky Way and the local group and the universe and all of that stuff. And, and I get a kick out of it because they send me all sorts of fun postcards and the more creative ones, you get all sorts of fun creative stuff. But I think it makes us think about it a little bit that we don't just live in Oregon, we also live on the earth and we live in this and we live in this universe. And so your cosmic address is something to think about. Let me take eight minutes and, 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 and talk to you about exoplanets for a few minutes because I truly think that this is gonna be one of the defining discoveries of our time. I, I believe that a thousand years from now, there's gonna be the, the Encyclopedia of the Cosmos. And some student is gonna take a, a, a stick and stick it in their head and download the whole thing. And, and, and they're gonna look at the history book. And in the history book, there's gonna be the 2000s. And let's go to a history book right now and look about the 1000s. And you get about this much. You know what, a thousand years ago, it was like, oh, some people in Europe were at war or something. I don't even know what the hell's going on. But a thousand years from now, I think you're gonna look back and it's gonna say the 2000s, these people did two incredible things. We invented computers and we discovered exoplanets. And I think this is a very profound, profound discovery that we've made. The very first exoplanet, by the way, is an exoplanet, is a planet 
that is orbiting a star that is not the sun. It's exterior. It's exterior to the solar system. The first ones were discovered in the 90s. And when I first started teaching five years ago, we knew of about a thousand around other planets. And every term, I update it. 1800, 2016, there were 1900, October, 3300, April of last year, 3500, October of last year, 3500. In your lifetime, even the youngest people in this room, in your lifetime, we have gone from knowing zero planets outside the solar system, we now can literally see 3,500 of them. That is something. And hundreds of years from now, fingers crossed, our species is on the way out there in some way. We now know so much about these, and we've discovered so many of them, that we can start to do statistics and we can start to make predictions about where these planets live and what they look like and, and how many of them are. And just in the last year or so, the, the astronomers that study these things have come out with statements saying, we are now very confident that on average, every star in the sky has at least one planet. That, some of them have eight, ours nine, some of them may have none, some of them have one or two. But when you go out, the next time you go out and see a, a dark sky, think of the crazy old astronomer guy standing up here on stage right now. On average, every star you see has a planet around it. And just maybe there's a bizarro person standing on that planet looking back at us, you know? I think that's something to interest them. They're so far away, we can't see them very well. All we can see are little points. There, there's a planet, there's one. This is a particularly interesting system that has three planets around it, so we've actually discovered another solar system. By the way, quick sidebar, our, 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 um, our system is called the solar system because the sun's name is Sol, right, S-O-L. So we are the system of Sol. It'd be kind of cool if it were the system of S-O-U-L, that would be cool too, but okay, we're the system of Sol anyways, the solar system. And this one, HR 4799, is the first solar system of planets that we've discovered around another star. And so this is an interesting, interesting thing because what it's done is it's changed our position in the universe. A thousand years ago, the Earth was the center of the universe. 400 years ago, the sun became the center of the universe. A hundred years ago or so, we realized that neither of them is the center of the universe. And now 20 years ago, we realized that we're not even unique, our planet's not even unique. So it's a little bit sad, we're losing our specialty in some sense, but on the other hand, I would argue that this is a profound discovery for our species. And as far as we know, we are the only species in the entire universe that understands this. And I think that's a very neat thing. We live in a very privileged time right now. And science has done some wonderful things for us. So let me, um, let me, let me end with these last two slides and show you Pine Mountain one last time. And, 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 and give you the idea that when you look up and you see the sky like this again, please keep these things in mind, how far away those stars are. It's three-dimensional, and there's probably a planet around every one. So I'd love to take some questions. Thank you for your attention, and I really appreciate you inviting me to come down and talk. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Fisher, and we'll gladly take questions from the audience. If you've got a question, bear with me. I'm a little slow getting over there. All right. All right. Uh, I was curious, Doc, if you think, um, do you think it's possible that we as a species will be able to overcome the problem with velocity and time and, and all that? I mean, because that obviously <laughs> It is a bummer, I agree. Yeah. So, so the question is, is that do, do we have a feeling that we will eventually be able to overcome the biggest problem with this distance? This is an interesting, so how far away have humans been from Earth? The farthest a human being has ever been with from Earth is the backside of the moon, right? So again, that's one light second, Clip, boom, one second away. E Mars, okay, three days to get to the moon seven months just to get to Mars, 10 years to get to Saturn, and 
tens of thousands of years to get to the nearest star with our technology today. I, I, it, look, there is nobody in this room that loves Star Wars more than me, let me tell you first of all. And Star Trek for that matter. Okay, it turns out, you know, that John Luke Picard, make it so, write the ball, okay, so anyways. So look, I want it real bad, but it's just not here yet. We are gonna need to get real lucky and, and, and discover some physics that we don't understand yet, or we do it the hard way and build a ship and generations of human beings living on, on, on the way. But for now, we're not there. Um, I think we do the remote sensing. We do our best with telescopes and radio telescopes and things like that. Um, but for the time being, Star Wars is just a dream. So what do you think of the results of the uh, two neutron stars that have collided with each other? So um, this is a wonderful, wonderful event. And by the way, um, you, uh, we may or may not know, but UO Physics is deeply involved in the observatory called LIGO. And LIGO is the observatory that recently um, watched in real time two neutron stars merge together into a black hole and also um, gave off some very interesting radiation that we detected. Um, it is a wonderful confirmation of a theory that was put forth about 50 years ago that um, if anybody has any gold or silver um, on tonight, um, guess where that gold came from? One of those um, events right there. The gold that you have on and the silver that you have on was created in a merger of, of neutron stars like that. Um, to me, the, the most incredible um, part of it is the confirmation of the idea that was generated 50 or so years ago. But see, I'm a techie guy, so I love the technology. And the technology of LIGO is even more impressive than the technology of something like Gemini but they work together. LIGO detected the gravity waves, and that same night, Gemini went and looked and discovered the light, the light that we can see of the merger. So that was an absolutely confirmed event, and not only that, it actually confirmed the ideas that we've had for a long time. Great, we are, we are, we are living in a revolution of, in astronomy right now. It's a wonderful time to be an astronomer. So the question is, is are we going to hit Andromeda? So Andromeda is the nearest big galaxy. It's our neighbor galaxy. So we have the Milky Way, and then Andromeda is also a big spiral galaxy, right? Andromeda actually looks like one of these. Don't, don't watch right now. I'll try to go back and see a picture. Um, the short answer is absolutely, we're going to hit Andromeda. Um, the Milky Way and Andromeda are flying towards each other right now about 400 miles a second. So, ooh, 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 400, 400, oh, so we're a lot closer right now than we were 10 minutes ago. But Andromeda is a long way away, and it's not going to happen for about 3 billion years. It's going to start on a Thursday. I'm just joking. We don't know about the Thursday. <laughs> so, so absolutely, we, we know now. But here's, I think, your real question is, is here's a neat thing. You might think that when the galaxies plow into each other, all sorts of stuff happens. But stars actually will go like this. The stars will go right by each other. So there will be none, no stars will collide with each other, but there's a lot of material in between the stars. That's where the fireworks happen. When one big cloud of gas plows into another cloud of gas, then you get star formation and supernova and all sorts of things. So yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, go to YouTube, turn on Safe Search, and type Milky Way Andromeda Collision, and there are wonderful animations and simulations that show what's gonna happen. It's going to be awesome. So come on back about three and a half billion years from now. <laughs> if only. <laughs> yes, sir. So, um, so what the gentleman was at, let me make sure, let me rephrase your question to make sure I understand it. When we talk about these exoplanets, um, many of them are not what we sort of expected. Some of, uh, many of these planets are, let me get to the picture real quick. Um, many of the planets are much closer to their stars than we predicted. They're, they're um, Venus and worse. They're 
900 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, so where we don't particularly think um, that life can exist. But there is around every star what we call the Goldilocks zone, where that planet is just far enough away where liquid water can exist on its surface. And of the 3,500, about 1% give or take some, are very close to their Goldilocks zone. So we know now of maybe two or three hundred planets that are very close to this zone around their stars, but there's only a handful of those planets that are about the size of Earth. So we haven't found, you know, the one yet, um, but we're getting darn close. And by the way, in the next couple years, there's going to be, well, let me be careful, um, last month, a brand new telescope named TESS, T-E-S-S, -S, was launched. And, and I, I guarantee every person in this room that in the next two years, TESS is going to fi find 10,000 new planets, at least. And we, some people think it might be 20 or 30,000. And so you stay tuned, and over the next year or two, I, I feel very strongly that we're going to start finding them in what's called the Goldilocks zone. Now, there's still going to be a tiny little dot. We're not going to be able to know much about them, but at least we know they're there, and that's something. That's something. Yes, sir. I was about to hi hijack a question to ask you about that. So it was a, so it was a nice thing that you mentioned Tess, because that was the yep. ones I was going to bring up. How far can we look away to see how early things have happened? Oh, you had to ask. <laughs> this is the part I skipped. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you one more thing. This, this picture right here, if, if, some, if you held my thumb down and said, Fisher, pick the one picture, I would pick either, I can't pick, it's got to be two. It's the Saturn, it's the Earth from Saturn, or it's this one. This is called the Hubble Deep Field. This is an image that the Hubble Space Telescope took they did a crazy, they did an insane thing with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, an astronomer went to their boss and they said, boss, sit down, I've got an idea. I wanna take the Hubble Space Telescope and I wanna take one image that lasts 10 days. Sit down. And, 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 and not only that, I wanna take it and I wanna point it at the emptiest part of the sky, sit down, the emptiest part of the sky that we can find. And so there was a year-long campaign, and all the telescopes in the world went and mapped the sky. And we found what we thought is the emptiest part of the sky. By the way, there it is down in the southern hemisphere. The person convinced the boss, and the boss said, do it. And they took the Hubble, it's only 11 days, took the Hubble Space Telescope, opened the camera, and 11 days later, shut it. And they read it out, and people were like, ah! You're not going to see it. You're not going to see anything. Yeah, what you saw was that. This. 5,000 galaxies. Now, here's the last little interactive part of the, of the... Everybody, take your hands, take your thumbs and your fingers like this. Make a little square and smoosh them together. Not real hard, but about as hard as you can smoosh them. And then take that. And that's how big on the sky that picture is. It is a... T that, it is literally like that big on the sky. And there's 5,000 galaxies there. This is what we call the deepest image ever taken by humanity. And you can't tell so much, but there are tiny, faint little things that you can't really see on the screen. Some of those galaxies are about 80% across the universe. 13 billion light years, if you wanna go. So again, I hope you got upgraded to first class. But um, about 80% across the universe is a, a short answer to a really great question. Yes, sir? What part of an arc second? That's, it's, that is um, about 15 arc seconds on a side. 15 arc seconds. Yeah. So, here, so if you, everybody, we sort of know about how big the moon is in the sky. If you take the moon and chop it 4,000 4, times, 3,600 times, and 3,600 times, that one square is one arc second. So again, you know, kind of a, about as big about as big as you can smoosh your fingers together. It's something. Yes, ma'am. Is the um, universe flat? Is it spreading? And is time moving faster? Is, is time going faster? And the universe is it collapsing or is it all encompassing? 
you need to come and take Astronomy 321 with me. No, I love these questions. Let me give you a, 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 simple, a, a short answer is that um, we don't know if what, now let me be very, very careful here because there's some weird flat earth BS going around right now. And this has nothing to do with that. This has to do with a mathematical term called flat or curved. Um, it's unclear if the universe is flat or curved. However, what is very well observed is that the universe is expanding. And not only is it expanding, the, the, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And so um, what that means is, is that there is physics that happens in our universe that we don't yet understand. And, and so um, the question of flat versus curved is strictly a mathematical one. Don't worry about that one so much. But, the, but we know for sure, because we look out and actually see this happening, that not only is the thing expanding, the pedal is to the floor, and the expansion is being driven by um, something that we call dark energy. And it's, we call it dark energy because we have no idea what it is. And we had to come up with a name, and somebody came up with that. But so the truth is, is exactly that. Not only is it expanding, but the expansion is accelerating. So I'll tell you what, let me, let me turn you all loose. And then, um, and I want to thank you all again, but I'm very happy to stay and, and, and talk afterwards too. But let's turn everybody loose for a time. Thank you. Does that help? Is that okay?